let's throw in a couple of other factors. Um, scarcity of talent, which is something you may challenge in the first place. And uh, higher wages for critical jobs, currency effects, I think one of you mentioned. Uh, how do you manage these in these environments? Sorry, say again. Scarcity of talent, higher wages for critical jobs, and the currency effects, which have made hiring difficult uh, in the past year. OK. <clears throat> Uh, see, uh, these have been a uh, couple of burning issues and uh, after the uh, economic uh, problems, uh, the focus shifted on uh, uh, the cost for the talent. I think for the last uh, two years, we are constantly uh, working on uh, this, this particular area. How do we uh, utilize the current resource with us? How do we, uh, without bringing in the fresh talent, we have not stopped the, the, uh, the fundamental or the basic uh, pipeline. That's true. But the leadership, we have realigned. We have given uh, op the new opportunities to many different leaders, uh, the radical change. I mean, we have re tried as per the natural talent available not going by the qualification side and the long experience, relative experience. And then that model has given us a proper yield that uh, we have worked on the, uh, the cost saving also and we have really built the talent as per our choice. So on that front, we have managed that way for the last two years. Otherwise, you know, the market situation, my colleagues uh, will throw better light because they are hiring continuously. We have uh, blocked that front and we have really worked hard in uh, building our own talent and using them in higher position, complex positions, and it has given real good results. I just turn to you, Devabrat, on that one. As an observer, what, what do you think? Um, has it been especially difficult? How, how have people coped? How, how do people cope? How have people coped with this idea of um, scarcity of talent, higher wages, critical jobs? currency effects, I mean, what are you seeing? See, uh, we are seeing uh, different aspects of the problem. So on one side, people really do not, because of the economic downturn, uh, the switchover of jobs or then multiple job offers, as Gatsby was saying, that two job uh, offers are in hand, that situation has changed a bit. Uh, within, uh, within the organization, there is definitely a need to get to much more productive talent. And the two options are that either you start uh, getting more productive talent from outside and weed out the non-productive talent from within the organization, or you get the existing talent that you have to be more productive, right? Uh, but I would believe that, uh, especially in India, uh, if I were to look at the talent uh, acquisition uh, side, I think we suffer from, and uh, similar to a fast food culture, you know, we want everything to be pre-cooked and ready and we grab it and we run with it. And it, we know that fast food culture leads to obesity and you, know, you tend to uh, gain a lot of fat. And during the economic downturn, that's the one that's pinching organizations the most. So you find organizations getting focused on cutting flab and getting ready for the upturn. And that, that whole focus of do I buy or do I build, I think in the recent past when the economy was booming, a uh, lot of people got into the, let me buy quickly. I think the shift is now slowly sh turning towards, let me build good quality talent internally. So I would say that that's the change that we are seeing. So I think this goes back to your initial remarks where you spoke of the privilege of living through downturns, which I yeah. didn't appreciate as well then, but I think I that's understand right. now. Uh, Gayatri, what, what do you feel? You know, if I look at the, the services industry or the ITS, and I'll speak a little bit from experience, there are a couple of things happening. Everyone wants to operate in the niche skill set. You want to move up the value chain because you want to add uh, more value back because it's higher margin business. So everybody wants to be able to do that. The interesting thing is the buy versus build mm -hmm. becomes relevant uh, if, um, only if you're a stable organization. If you're growing very fast, uh, you have no choice but to buy, actually. You don't have the time to build. So I think the life stage of where you are as an organization also determines how much you do of what. Sure. The issue that we are grappling with is what gets churned out from universities mm -hmm. cannot be hired, absorbed, 
and put to task. And there is that gap which organizations are ha having to invest in uh, immediately after hiring people. That's one part of it. On the niche skill side, there aren't enough people. So there is a huge scarcity, that, a real scarcity that exists. What do we as HR professionals uh, do when we partner with the business? Because the work is coming in, you still need to solve. Mm -hmm. You don't want to turn work away. You need to create a short-term solution of how you can build um, uh, scalability. We've done it in a few ways. Um, I have for multiple niche skills, and we work in the very high end of healthcare work, um, academies which run. So which means at any point in time, in a 12 to 16 week time frame, I can create multiples of similar type of skill mm -hmm. because partnering with the right people and in-house, we can transmit and certify people. But I do know that, that that's only a short to medium term solution. At some point in time, they will, fatigue will set in or we won't be able to give the right kind of uh, uh, quality that the business needs. So now parallelly, the issue comes, can I work and work back with universities or mm -hmm. in, you know, to go back and say, how does this have to change? I need more of a certain type. Right. And if I don't drive it, it ain't gonna happen. And I think that's the thinking that we need to drive. Um, so this would involve um, funding, uh, working with universities, providing them uh, the means to uh, impart this education, or how does yes, it go? Yes, it, it could mean funding, it could mean helping defining curriculum, it could mean maybe teaching some of it because it doesn't exist. Yes. So finding the right model uh, to be able to say when people come out, they're ready to hire. Otherwise, we're making, see, when you do an ROI and a business comes back and tells hmm. me, why should I do it? The point is you're spending that kind of money. You can easily do a CBA to say, I'm spending that money from the time I hire somebody and bring them up to speed in a 12 to 16 week framework. So you might as well get something ready to, ready to eat in that yeah. sense. So, so Jeet, uh, I think taking on from Gayatri's yeah. points about which stage of the uh, lifespan you are in, you're a fairly young company still, and you've faced multiple challenges. Uh, hiring highly skilled technical people is always an issue. You, I'm sure, have something to say here. Yeah, so rightly said. In fact, uh, the advantage to us is that we're still growing. So a lot of, lot of growth opportunities uh, ahead for people. Uh, so hiring as well as internal growth opportunities for people. However, uh, in, in this growth, I think what we're trying to also manage is uh, scale and uh, deliver, as I mentioned to you earlier, about reliability for the customer. Uh, so I'll just take an analogy here. Let's say uh, if, if, we are a, if we have to compare with the Margarita pizza being delivered, let's say by Domino's, uh, when it was selling 2,000 per day, now selling 20,000 sorry, 20 million per day. So how do we deliver a similar quality uh, when we have more and more flights getting added, more and more operations uh, growing? And similarly, uh, in fact, driving the same, having the same skill set with, with let's say 7,500 people of, for customer, on customer orientation, when vis-a-vis -vis what we used to have, let's say about 2,500, 3,000 few, few months back. So uh, I think the challenge is definitely in hiring, but also maintaining the quality uh, when, we, when we are growing almost every day. Perfect. And uh, Debranj? Last one in the, in, in, in the setting. I'll, I'll, show of hands, how many of you believe there is a scarcity of talent? Can I just see a show of hands? So there is no scarcity? I mean, it's less than half, what, one-fourth? What about the others? How many people believe we are facing a scarcity of talent today? Raise your hands, please. Scarcity of talent. You can qualify it, but is there a scarcity of talent, yes or no? How many people believe that? What? That's what, one? Okay, great. The others don't believe, so how many people believe there is no scarcity of talent? You define it the way that it makes sense for you. How many people believe we have no scarcity of talent? What about the three-fourths of the room who didn't raise hands on either side? <laughs> <laughs> They're very talented. So, uh, if I turn the question around, I, I think there is a, f how do I put it? I think we have a solution and we are also the problems ourselves. How many times have HR managers not said, I think this was the best guy, but business said no? How many times? Almost every second, you know? This desire of getting the best talent, the guy and the best talent is defined as consistent performance previously. The moment you look at high performers, you end up paying more 
Whereas you don't really take into account, and I absolutely like that point of right talent, which is the, the environment in which this person needs to come in. If you look at the frame this way and say at the end it's about fitment because today change management, managing pressure, ambiguity is of a high order and if you train a guy well, performance happens, you can build skills, you can't build attitudes or behavior, I think the talent market opens up. All right, that, that's, my, that's my experience and that's what we are trying to do, that's number one. Uh, the second is at times it's good to stay away from the noise, you know when you read the, the mint, should I say? And it Go talks ahead. about the economy going down and you read it day in, day out, you're conditioned. Uh, there are organizations who prefer to stay away from the din. So you make your own rules and that's how you stand out. And you do whatever it takes. So at times it's good to stay away from the McKenzie reports that says there is a talent war and see what you can do. Uh, you talked of a frame about cost of talent and impact. So it's very simple. As the uh, working population becomes younger, Aspirations are growing, right? I, I, this is the model that I use. Aspirations are growing. Organizations are stabilizing or growing down from a productivity, profitability frame. This model will never meet, right? Uh, to me, the fundamental, therefore, is the way we have designed some of our reward, remuneration, and other tools. Because today in India, the focus is still fixed. You know, you negotiate on fixed salaries. Let's be honest about it. Uh, in the West, the, the, it has moved from a fix to a total compensation, where the, the, the play has moved to variable, which is really unlimited or aggressive. So I think it's an opportunity in the way that we design our internal systems, uh, a, a, a reward policies that align to the longer term, link to organizational growth, and start deferring fixed, and look at a, you know, what consultants call a total value proposition or a, or a total compensation, which includes the way that you do training, your culture, your value proposition, Everything combined into one neat package. At middle to Sina, by the way, to attract talent, compensation really is secondary because they can command the premium that they want. This value proposition, I think, is what they really look forward to. Sure. So I, I, I think it's the frame and the way that you define it. And therefore, in this same economic downturn, there are organizations doing fantastic, no issues with talent. I think HDFC stands out in my frame of reference. And there are others who are facing the same challenge. Mm -hmm. The question is why? I, I think some of these cultural ethos, the way that you look at talent, the way you assess, the way you hire, are fundamentals to this change. Shankar, uh, yeah. I just wanted to, uh, you know, use this opportunity to highlight one aspect. Uh, for most HR professionals, you would have heard the name of David McClelland, right? He is uh, attributed to be the father of competencies. Now, David McClelland's work around motives, you know, so the motives theory was, Social, uh, the social motives of affiliation, power, and achievement, you would be surprised to know that he did his research for coming up with this theory. His research was done in India, in Kakinada. And one of the things that David McLellan's research found out is that in India, we are born with a very high achievement motive ingrained in us, right? Now take that and look at this response of saying that we have a scarcity of talent. If you were to define talent as the innate desire to achieve, and you took that and you molded it, I think this country has probably the largest population to provide you with the raw material to create great talent. Uh, I would say that somehow over a period of time with the use of practices and you know policies, as we were uh, laughing uh, before the session, that nobody knows why it is there, but it is there, so we just follow it. Our search for qualification as a surrogate for assessment, that I will not assess what skill the candidate has. I will take the qualification as a surrogate for it and save some, some time. I think that's at the root cause of not having good quality talent because institutions are preparing qualifications rather than the skill sets that corporates require. So the moment, even if 50% of HR professionals in this room went out, and I have this uh, thing about Shine as well, you go on to Shine or any job portal, I think the one thing you will definitely find is qualification required. The day all of us in this room take a call saying that 50% of the hiring, I will not mention the qualification, but the skill set or experience, I think that will be the shift that is required in the, uh, in the business world. Can, can I, I just can add, add something to this? Sure. Uh, Sorry, Sanjeev, go ahead. Okay, just want to add one thing here in, in terms of hiring. Uh, well, we, we all may be hiring a lot of young professionals, and uh, 
I think one good job that we do is maybe attracting them, and especially it becomes easy for us when we look at the best, and they, they want to join the best in the industry. But I think uh, we also do a, uh, probably a good job in maybe deselling uh, at that point before they, before they join us. So Sorry, that I, I couldn't get we, we, I said we also doing uh, maybe a good job in terms of deselling the job. You know, mm -hmm. they, they may be getting attracted towards the best industry, they may be getting attract, attracted towards the glamour that are going to join. So I think glamour of the industry, flying, et cetera, but I think there needs to be a good job in, t in terms of deselling as to what are they getting into. And I think we, we, we spend enormous time uh, before, before they join. In fact, a lot of BPO companies may be doing that also. So that is one, I think, reality check which needs mm -hmm. to be provided to, to the youngsters especially uh, when they're, they're starting the career fresh. I was just trying to say, so uh, let me simplify and on the lighter side. Assuming your business heads had a goal sheet, and the goal sheets are revenue driven, let's say sales, in which 50% of the weightage of the goal sheet is on acquisition, chances are the organization will have no talent scarcity. <laughs> That's the, you know, if I look at it that way. I think the onus has moved so much on HR's responsibility to acquire talent, I think there are some links that's broken. To me, fundamental talent acquisition is a core business responsibility, and we enable. That's one frame. The second one is, and this goes back to HR's role as a strategic partner or being at the table. There are some other fundamentals that is impacting talent acquisition, and it's not about only scarcity. You know, when the economy is not doing well, when there are challenges around performance of the organization, when compensation revisions and bonus payouts are going down, I would say that even the high performing and the average performing employees loathe to leave their organization where they have an internal brand and take a risk in another organization where they have to build everything from scratch. So to me, there's a very strong element of the sectoral value proposition or the organization's value proposition, which makes a significant difference to talent attraction. You know, when you talk HUL on campus or Coke, you have no choice, there are people lining up. When you talk of another retail organization, people run away. And, and that's the frame. I think if you can work and create a value proposition, and again, I'm saying it's not about money, a brand that stands out, that tells people what they are in for and how would they progress in the continuum of their career and their professional development, the, the market opens up more. The market opens up more. So. Sure. No, thanks for that. Uh, let's press on a bit. We are getting close to the danger mark. Um, a lot of our companies have a great buzz about them, and that's due in large measure to the youthful character of the workforce, which brings with it its own challenges, the demographic uh, challenge. I know Gayatri has got some views on this. Um, how do you manage uh, young people? So I think uh, it's probably not new to any one of us sitting in this room that the characteristics displayed uh, uh, by this millennial uh, crowd uh, is very different. And my experience tells me, I'm not talking from research, is they're looking for real-time appreciation and the recognition element, not reward. They're looking for real-time communication. They're looking for real-time feedback, not the biannual or the annual which exists today. Uh, they are looking to have real-time conversations on their career. They are not scared to challenge. Uh, they are looking to be different, which means they want to collect experiences as opposed to a conversation which says, when am I being promoted? They know that if they ask for what my next role is, it'll happen in due course. So I think the type of conversations uh, that are being raised at the, at the workplace have become very different, real time being what I call the, uh, you know, the buzzword on this one, which puts pressure on us as HR to ask ourselves a couple of questions. Mm -hmm. Do we have technology uh, aiding our processes and our systems, because this group of people is extremely tech savvy. I don't think they want to be at a desk to go and put leave applications and stuff like that. Ideally, they would want to have mobile apps where they can go and do it when they decide they want something. So I'm just taking an example. The second thing is this group of people is extremely, is looking for social collaboration tools at the workplace. And organizations right now have differing views. Some are extreme to say not allowed because they impact uh, productivity to some where uh, they, you know, uh, they allow it. Some, some monitor it by timings. It's all sorts of funny things which exist. Are we willing to experiment in this sphere and figure out what it really does uh, to this group of people? But I think it throws up a third challenge, uh, Shankar, mm -hmm. the way I see it is, this group of employees does not want to be known as an employee ID. 
they have a unique identity, they want to be known for interests they have outside of the workplace, they want to be known uh, and understood for you know, their experiences that they may be having in their life, which means who needs to understand that? Their supervisor or their manager? And I don't think that equation is fully solved for today. Do we have effective supervisors? I'm not talking of efficient supervisors at all, who can actually engage uh, this group of people and give them the experience and the type of conversations they're looking for. And to me, that is the biggest challenge that I have with my business and my team to say, how can we convert that group of people to keep this group engaged? Sure. I think we come across a similar problem in media, problem asset. Uh, whichever way you want to call it. We have a lot of very young people who we struggle to engage, very, very frankly. Uh, you have some views on the use of social media and uh, other gizmos. Yeah. So we have a, a big younger population and I think uh, as Gayatri mentioned, uh, they, they're looking for instant recognition, they're looking for uh, instant uh, uh, rewards and also uh, so, so there, first of all, I think we, we're doing a a fairly uh, decent job on uh, having a three-hour kind of philosophy wherein uh, respect, reward, and rec recognize and reward. So we, we believe in instant recognition, as Gayatri mentioned. So we, we have uh, some, some sort of a social media application wherein anybody can recognize anybody. And I think that's, that's where uh, we're just trying to propagate that, uh, launch that quickly so that anybody uh, across the organization can reach out to anybody. And secondly, uh, there's a lot of new ideas to tap from the younger population. So, uh, well, we also need to channelize those ideas, otherwise uh, they will stop sharing those. So in various forums, we openly recognize these uh, and, and make it a, a point that every day uh, that whosoever gives those ideas uh, are captured. Uh, we go back to them after even discussion in the in the boardroom and say that okay yes this works this doesn't work why it doesn't work you have you have given us a great idea but this doesn't work in in our context and why it doesn't work so i think the duty is on us the responsibility is on us to go back and and share with them the logic behind why it doesn't work for us so and and the third thing that we are trying to do is a lot of education uh, especially the youngsters if they fall to temptations around within the company first job second job so they may not have seen the professional world uh, till now, so this is the first experience. So how do we educate them constantly so that we don't have to reach a state where we have to part the way? So I think that's, that's a big onus on, on, on managing the younger population. Yeah. Just one very quick question, unless you have anything to say on this. Um. Yeah, maybe I can share okay. a quick okay. snapshot. First, I mean, your question was how do you manage them? I think they manage themselves. Mm. Uh, you, you know, if you see the Gallup Q12, the engagement model, it says that employees join an organization, but they leave the managers. So I'm absolutely with Gayatri um, that at the fundamental of this is the supervisor, and therefore, how are we enhancing their capability to manage whatever demographics, but it will be a mix, and therefore, their level of maturity. Beyond that, there is this discussion a lot of us keep doing about an employee value proposition, an EVP, and, and that, I think, is fundamental because what was one standard EVP is no longer applicable. Mm -hmm. Today, I think the approach is a segmented approach. So therefore, if you break up your organization by levels or qualifications or, or gender, whatever, there is always a segmented approach. And therefore, on one hand, if you list down rewards, training, whatever, the whole plethora, and you look at the segmentation, your ability to, ability to sharply look at what you need to do to that segment is of a far higher order. I don't see many organizations looking at that. It, it's pretty, pretty much one, you know, uh, one brush paints at all. I don't think that is how one can manage, uh, you know, this population. You have to go the segmented route. Sure. I would like to add uh, the thing which I emphasized earlier also. <coughs> I really appreciate. Uh, but the real thing which we have seen that the employee looks forward is the opportunity to experiment. The opportunity which the organization gives you to try the cross-functional talent available. Talent actually has a vast uh, uh, ideas attached to it, but which suits the organization is the most important thing. There may be huge talent available outside the market, outside the organization, but that's of no use to you. Even if you bring some high flyer, high performing person literally comes to your organization and disturbs so many things, that will be rather damage to the organization than bringing value to the organization. Instead, if you give real opportunity to somebody 
who has the dedication and commitment and some core values of the organization are really uh, you know, nurturing in him, if he takes the responsibility and if he really comes out with something unique and it really adds good value to the overall business of the organization. That's what I, I've been uh, saying, that that's the need of the R, that we must give newer opportunities to the existing talent. Sure. Perfect. So now we have about uh, 12, 13 minutes more. So we'll try and paint this portrait this, uh, of the ideal HR manager, senior manager 3.0, if we could take 2.3 minutes each and uh, give us maybe uh, speak to one point, give us your contribution, then we'll move around the, around the table. Want to, want to start? What is one key attribute of uh, HR manager 3.0? And how do you get there? Uh, as we said, the one key attribute to the HR manager is that he should be people's manager, he should be people's person. He must understand the people available in the organization through and through. He must touch people, he must connect very well. And then understanding of business, must uh, he must add value to the business and guide the top leadership how we can make the best use of the talent available in the organization. If you are thorough, if you have the good connectivity and touch with the whole population or whole talent resource available in the organization, you should really help the overall design of the organization, you should help the top leadership. And one tip as to how to get there? How do you get there? One tip. I mean, how does an HR professional? Getting over there is that you have to sync it, you have to really connect with people, you have to spend time, you have to invest in understanding your organization. You have to shred the inhibitions, you have to move from your chair, you have to really go and connect with your people, sit with them, understand, and then when you really get through in the depth of that, you will feel that the pulse of the organization is in your hands and you can really guide the top man to use your talent. Sure, thank you. Uh, again, if I go back to the Dave Ulrich frame, uh, be between the four, while I said one moves, I think the role of the change agent is today the key skill set for an HR professional. I think in these trying times, the ability to be a catalyst and thereby enable uh, business to take decisions for the right interest is the most important. How does one do it? You know, if you ask me, I have no answer. Uh, because part of it to me is ingrained. There are biz HR people who can be very good in this because there is an inherent behavioral or attitudinal requirement, I, I, I believe, in this. Uh, so I don't know whether everybody can be. But so there's that piece. The second is about leveraging the self, supervisor, and organization, which is about how you're really leveraging a supervisor to help you understand business, I agree, and therefore move the ropes on that. The second is what are you doing about it with so much of information available? Are you proactive in reaching out to business and understand uh, or other factors. Networking, for example, it's a virtual word. The third is, is the organization enabling HR? Mm -hmm. And therefore, what is the organization doing to move the ropes? Because the same guy who was transactional has to be transformational. It's a very difficult ask to make. So the organization has to enable. That last point, okay. just taking you up on that, what does an organization need to do? How do they, um, it, it sounds really difficult. It, 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 First, I would say is an acceptance, and that's what mm -hmm. I'm saying, I, I see that happening. But first is the acceptance that complexity has grown, mm -hmm. and therefore the expectations from HR has evolved, it's more complex, and therefore the dynamics and the core ingredient of an HR professional is different. I think first is an admittance of that fact. Uh, and, and then look at it in terms of what is it that this team requires. And that's why I'm saying it is, there is a capability, but sure. more it's about giving the bandwidth to the time to integrate these people into core business. It needs to work both ways. Yeah. Because we can't keep pushing the envelope all the time. Somewhere these guys need to make the move. And that's how I think it's a co-created approach. That's, that, that's what I would say. Perfect. Yeah. Right, three. So um, I think I'll, I'll probably just say uh, a couple of things become important. The base is knowing and understanding the business because that will give you the strength to have quality conversations. The second, and I totally agree with Debraj, being a change agent is in today's day and age probably the most impactful outcome that an HR professional can drive. It's almost becoming uh, an expectation that HR will be at the forefront of change. Um, for that and for having acceptance, you need to have very good um, 
teamwork and acceptance with business leaders, which means you need to network, you need to ensure that any solution you're creating is co-created, you're partnering, because you'll never be too many people to even ensure implementation. So unless you have like a strong extended team, uh, you won't be able to do it, which mm -hmm. means you need to have the ability to carry those extended teams with you because the idea and design may be yours, and you need to have the influencing capability. I'll add just one more project management. Normally, HR professionals don't think it's at the core of what they do. Project management sits on the business side. Uh, you know, uh, however, today, you cannot do anything. A lot of what we do today is initiatives, it's tracks, and unless you conceptualize and execute seamlessly, uh, you haven't seen the light of day. So I'd add project management as Perfect. well. And uh, getting the training, um, what, sort, what sort of training do you see? I mean, is it virtual training? Is it actual in classroom? You know, I would actually say it's experience. Right. For <laughs> HR, with the kind of stuff that they are driving, mm -hmm. uh, you know, they've got their degrees, they've got whatever they do normally, but this part, influencing and driving change will come only from experience. So I hate saying it that it is, some of it is being in those difficult situations, uh, stumbling and falling a couple of times and then actually learning how to Perfect. meander way through. Devabrat. Yeah, I'll, I'll start with uh, defining two kinds of people who read. Uh, there's one type of reader who has a bookshelf filled up with books that he has already read. And there's another reader who has a bookshelf filled up with books that he hasn't read, or he or she hasn't read. I would believe HR 3.0 is about the reader who has a bookshelf with books that he or she hasn't read. And therefore, it, it suffices to say that this person does not have has an HR degree, doesn't, doesn't have an HR degree, hasn't come from an institution which has certified him to be an HR professional, but has an innate desire to actually come into the function and find out what is it that he or she can do to actually impact and help the organization. I think that's the mindset of a very hungry learner, experimenter, innovator. I think Umesh and Sujith have both talked about that characteristic, who doesn't believe that he or she knows everything and is willing to explore and find out why things are done in a particular way and what needs to change. I think that would be the definition of the third version of HR professional. So a curious person who's always looking to pick up yeah, stuff and, around. Yeah, that's right. And somebody who doesn't know anything about HR hasn't been certified in HR, definitely. So that means none of us here fit that bill. Yeah. So it's I not this room, I presume. I didn't say that. Yeah. <laughs> doesn't necessarily come from an HR background. Yeah, that's right. Uh, but this sounds very much like an ingrained, inbuilt, someone is either has it or not. Uh, you can't, can you train this? See, uh, for, for example, I think, uh, uh, you know, you, you, don't, you don't design uh, systems and processes because you have the answers. You design systems and processes because the, the user has to use it. But if you look at uh, the learning that is ingrained in us, we believe that systems and processes have to be designed in a particular way. But the moment you ask somebody why, they don't have an answer. And the user is changing. You know, Gayatri talked about the millennials. Mm -hmm. The user is changing rapidly, but we are still using the same old systems and processes which were taught in the same B schools uh, 20 years back by the same professors. Because 90% of all senior HR professionals in this country are from maybe one or two B, B schools. Mm -hmm. Most interesting. Subjit. So I think I would say that uh, in, the, in this scenario, we, uh, the HR, a manager can in fact uh, drive or, or build and drive passion uh, through people managers. I think that's that's the key ingredient. Uh, now passion here can be, it's, it's difficult I know, but I think it's simply maybe uh, understood as uh, energizing people to something which is core, something which is core to the organization, uh, whether it's customer or, or company goals or success factors for the organization. I think how, how does HR facilitate that through people managers in, in both uh, good times and, and difficult times. So uh, that passion has to be there in the office. Could you give me an example? Uh, it it's, uh, seems a very strange thing to... Yeah. So I think uh, one of the things that we try and do is keeping things simple. So one of the Indigo philosophy is like besides on time, we call it hassle-free. Hassle-free is one of yeah. the philosophies that we have. So 
how do our managers keep it simple for people in everything not only for the customers but also internally we we drive this philosophy in terms of like for, for example our our operating manuals you will find best of the operating manuals in this industry in various companies but our operating manuals are very close to the reality so uh, and and we do look at it change it make it practical for the people so that they are able to implement the the, the things that are there in the operating manual on a day to day basis and so this in turn enthuses the, the staff to perform yeah absolutely mm -hmm. So that's uh, wonderful. We've had, uh, I don't think I've heard so many ideas in one hour uh, for a very long time. Uh, so it's, it's, I mean, looking, looking very quickly at uh, attributes of HR manager 3.0, people's person, uh, which seems an ingrained, uh, ingrained quality, which possibly can be learned as well over a period of time. Uh, uh, understanding the business is what we've heard a lot of, uh, being an integral part of the business, learning the balance sheets, learning the nuts and bolts of it, not uh, sitting sequestered in the HR conference room. Uh, role of the change agent, ability to be a catalyst, that's very clearly coming across again. Again, that seems a uh, quality which you either have or not, if I'm not wrong. Uh, having the, and then persuading business to accept you, uh, uh, persuading and in a sense having the expectation, having the right to have the expectation that business will make space for you. Uh, knowing, understanding the business again, being a change agent again, uh, the only uh, very good teamwork, acceptance, uh, project management I thought was very interesting. Uh, see yourself as project managers. Uh, you need to be people who haven't read the books on your shelf, uh, in a manner of speaking, but you, what, uh, what uh, I suppose uh, is the key point there is that you've got to be curious, you've got to have this innate desire to make a difference. And of course, you've got to build and drive passion, which you, uh, which some organizations seem to be doing through uh, clever ideas, which enthuse young people and enthuse uh, a, a workforce that constantly needs to be motivated. Thank you very much. I think now I can turn it over to Sandeep for the next steps. Mm -hmm.